Hey guys, today I'm going to talk about a few of my favorite fighters. This is one of them right here. He'll get up in the camera here. Well, he just went. One of my favorite fighters is our German Shepherd, Rocky, who insists upon getting in street fights a lot. Anyway, um, I'm going to talk about some of my favorite heavyweight boxers. And uh, I'm sure some of you will agree and some of you won't agree. And that's fine. It, it's subjective. I'm talking about my favorite. Not necessarily the greatest, but some of my favorite fighters. Uh, historically before me, but guys I like to watch on film, which are now on video, uh, I guess I'd have to go with uh, the Manassas Mahler, Jack Dempsey. What a ferocious guy. Uh, can't rightly think of the guy's name. Uh, he fought where he won the title. I believe it's Jess Willard. And I probably got this wrong. Big, huge guy. Big, huge guy. And Dempsey wasn't a big man. Uh, I believe Dempsey was about 5'11". And weighed 180 pounds. And he got in there against a guy well over 200 pounds. That was six foot six or six foot seven and just completely destroyed the guy. I believe the guy had several broken ribs, a broke nose, a broke jaw, two or three missing teeth, a broke cheekbone. I mean, he really deserved the name the Manassas Mauler. <laughs> he was a Mauler. So I like, I, I like him historically. I like, uh, let's see here. Yeah, I want to talk about Rocky. No, hold on a second, because I'm skipping who I believe was the greatest heavyweight boxer. Now I am saying greatest, but uh, and certainly one of my most favorite, and that's Joe Lewis. Uh, so not a lot more needs to be said about Joe Lewis. Joe Lewis was a very honorable man. Uh, he served the country well. Uh, he did everything his country asked of him. Uh, he got pooped on by the IRS. Uh, and the sickening thing there is is that he was giving to uh, injured World War II and World War I veterans organizations to help injured veterans. And the money that he gave just simply just not did not get recorded correctly or didn't get recorded. And he gave so much money that it put him hundreds of thousands of dollars in the red on taxes. Not, and if had he would have claimed that money, uh, he would have never had a tax problem. And it's just a cotton picking shame what the hell happened to him. Uh, after this happened and the IRS went after him, we had several presidents from uh, Republican and Democrat alike, nobody stepped forward to help him. Nobody. Zero. I believe maybe Reagan, now, and then I may be stand corrected on this because I don't want to give Reagan any credit if this didn't happen, but I think possibly Reagan had given tax amnesty on that, but I'm not positive about that. And if he did, he probably gave it to him uh, right before he died or when he died. Uh, so if he did, and I am correct, uh, you know, why didn't he give it to him before he died? So uh, 
don't want to hand out no candy to no politicians. Uh, but Joe Lewis was great. He held, he held that title for a dozen years. Uh, fought everybody they put in front of him. And I'm going to name somebody later that's similar to him but gets no credit. Uh, but we're going to get there. So, but we love Joe Lewis up in this house too. Um, Rocky Marciano. And I got another guy that I'm going to talk about right after in a few minutes that it was kind of some banging going on. Uh, but they're both in my favorites category. Well, why Marciano? Well, Marciano retired undefeated, 48-0. No. Uh, I don't want nobody handing no crap about he didn't fight nobody. Uh, he fought Ezra Charles. He fought uh, Jersey Joe Walcott. He fought everybody that was put in front of him. And uh, although he wasn't tenured for a decade or more, he fought who was put in front of him. And the big thing about him was this guy got his nose split wide open just like a flap here and kept fighting and uh, and won. Uh, this guy, the first time that he fought Walcott, and I guess he was fighting Walcott for the championship, I believe the eye split the, the nose split came when he fought former champion, world champion, Ezra Charles. Uh, they fought through that and whipped him. But uh, if you go back and you look up uh, Marciano Walcott 1, boy, that was one hell of a fight there. And uh, Walcott's winning that whole fight. Man, Walcott is clicking, and, and Walcott's a great fighter, too. I just would say I'm mentioning two great ones at one time here. Boy, Jersey Joe was something else. Jersey Joe Walcott. One of my dad's favorites, Jersey Joe Walcott. But uh, uh, Marciano was fighting him, and he was losing every single round. He was... Marsh, uh, Walcott was clicking on every cylinder and bam he got he, he caught Walcott up against the ropes with a left hook that just knocked Walcott slap out it was over uh, there's another fight I'm going to mention if I, I'm going to mention it right after this one just to mention the fight uh, because it's reminiscent of this fight so, uh, uh, Marciano fights, uh, get, has a return clause with Walcott, and then turns around and knocks Walcott out in the first round. Uh, there was some speculation on the count, but uh, nothing. it was nothing to come of it because Jersey Joe's, I mean, he went down and due to a left uppercut about two minutes, 30 seconds into the first round. And uh, Marciano hit him good with an uppercut. And uh, Walcott went down and Walcott went to get up at the count of nine and had his... Uh, his glove on the rope pulling him up and got his butt off the ground about this far off the canvas and they tried to say he beat the count and of course that's not beating the count you can't beat the count with one glove on the canvas uh, and one glove on the on the ring rope uh, and your butt off the ground about that far he got he got beat I mean he didn't under I think he didn't understand the count and I believe he could have got up but he just didn't get up before the count of ten. And you can easily see that if you go back and you look at that fight. It's 
easily visible. It's picked up on the audio or in the, the video and the audio. You see is the referee's mouth and the count moving, uh, you know, right on through from one to ten. Uh, and it's just, I mean, it's just evident. Uh, now, fight like the first wild cop fight that I'm going to go ahead and start talking about because I've been wanting to put a video out uh, about this guy and I'm, I'm going to put a video out about him uh, because he had a great trainer and all these guys come out of Knoxville, Tennessee and I'm talking about Big John Tate and Big John Tate lost the WBA version of the heavyweight championship in 1980, uh, I believe it may have been in February or March, maybe later. It might have been. It might might have been in June of 1980. And Big John Tate's fighting Mike Weaver, who was going to be a walkthrough for him. And they were already getting things set up for. A unification and for Larry Holmes to fight Big John Tate and Weaver was just a walkthrough for him and they got they had I believe 15 or 15 seconds left in the 15th round and BAM uh, Mike Weaver catches John Tate with a with a punch and John Tate's out like a light and he goes down. So if you, if you ever hear me referring to the Tate Syndrome, um, that's what I label what happens to a fighter when they get knocked out because Big John Tate was, was great up until that point. And when he suffered that knockout, he was never the same. He was gun shy and knew something was going on upstairs with him and we've seen that in, in some fighters we see it in fighters in recent times more than we saw it back then or before then uh, something that gets in the psyche of a fighter they suffer a, a good clean bad knockout and they the fighters today are just never the same and just don't don't pull through it so now I want to talk about Larry Holmes and uh, what was great about Larry Holmes. Everything that you would say if you know about heavyweight boxing, everything you would say is great about Tyson Fury and, and great about him, Larry Holmes was greater. Larry Holmes got nailed by several folks, got planted on the canvas, and boom, got up just like uh, uh, Tyson Fury does. So see, this that's nothing new. Uh, Tyson Fury's probably <coughs> able to do it because he's six foot eight and weighs three hundred pounds, two hundred and seventy pounds, or whatever. So it's, you know, you can take a, uh, a punch from a 230 or 40 pound guy, if you're 280 pounds, and you're that big and that big boned, you should be able to get up like that. Larry Holmes wasn't that big. Larry Holmes was 6'2 or 6'3, and uh, Larry weighed usually about, uh, from when he started, he was about 205 and ended up fighting around 218 normally 220 in his prime so uh, Larry Holmes was was great and one of my favorites for the recuperation ability that he had and he survived uh, from a fighter that he gave John Tate syndrome to which everybody wants to discount and say that was not a good fighter, but he was a great fighter. And uh, uh, Holmes mentions uh, 
Holmes is always on the fence with this. You can go look at 10 interviews, and in five interviews, you'll say Jerry Cooney was the best boxer and hardest puncher he ever faced. Then you go look at uh, other five interviews, and he'll say somebody who was a friend of mine for many, many years, Ernie Shavers, was the best. But, uh, a fighter that he fought. But uh, Jay Cooney was a good fighter. I'm not mentioning him in this list, but I'm just saying I'm mentioning Larry because Larry uh, got through and worked around all the strengths that Jerry Cooney had and beat him up and knocked him out by TKO. So we love some Larry up in this house too. Now I want to talk about uh, the Klitschko brothers. Um, not yet. Mike Tyson. Um, what can you say about Mike Tyson? Just literally, what can you say? And then I'm going to have to do a turn about. No, I won't. I'll do the favorite fighter at the very end. I've just got to keep all this in my brain. Mike Tyson. And damn, hitter from Hades. Um. Probably, in my guesstimation, the second hardest hitter of all time, bar nobody. Uh, who's the first hard, hardest hitter? Uh, the one that caused most damage, Sonny Liston. Uh, we'll get to him in a minute. So, Mike Tyson. Now, boxing was really, um, you have to understand this, and it, color-wise is really no barrier to it, no wises are no barrier to it. Everybody is, should understand this. It's nothing against Ali, and it's not that Ali is not the greatest that I'm not talking about him. It's that everybody always talks about him that I'm not talking about him. So I want to state that. But boxing during his time, and especially Ali's second tenure, and I'm not talking about the first tenure, but the second tenure. See, if you don't know about it, Ali got stripped of the titles, and then he got reinstated to box a few years later. And then Joe Frazier beat him. Um, and that would have been in 1971, I believe. So, um, got to watch that in the living room with my dad. Um, but, the, is it 71 or 72? Might have been in 70. I don't know. It was right around in there. I can't remember. But uh, Mike Tyson, enough said with him too, really, because um, everybody knows who he is and what he's accomplished. But well, one thing I'm one one thing I'm going to say. I got off point here. When Mike Tyson came about. Everybody was trying to emulate Muhammad Ali. Even Larry Holmes was a carried on version of Muhammad Ali. Dance around punch, dance around punch, dance around punch. And these things ended up more often than not, more up, up now, realize those words, more often than not, ended up in who could jump around, hop around the ring the most, and had the quickest left jab. And that would decide a fight. And that got old after a while. People didn't really didn't enjoy it no more. Uh, people were not enjoying boxing. I don't give a shit who says what. Now, no, I, I know of nobody, respectable of their... 
color that I, I would have been in school during this time, uh, high school or college, and had friends of all colors and stuff, you know. Uh, I knew of no one that was real excited about Ollie and Sphinx or uh, Shavers and Holmes or Ken Norton and Holmes and uh, all these fights. Now, one, one good one with Ali was that George Foreman fight. And boy, Ali showed, it showed that, boy, he did show the world something. That was not supposed to happen. Ali shocked the world two times big time. But as I'm saying, now we got the advertisers going up and down the street. This is Latin America, folks. And they're talking so fast, if you do understand Spanish, you don't know what the hell in the world, world they're saying. Uh, and I know because I asked people, I said, what the hell are they saying? This? I don't know. Damn talk of blah, 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 blah. I'm like, yes, yeah, what it sounds like to me, too. Uh, but people were getting sick of that. And uh, like when you had Holmes and Cooney, it wasn't black or white to me or my friends, but it got turned into that uh, by Jewish uh, sportscasters. And I'm, I'm going to be honest about that. The Jewish owners of the networks and the sports magazines and all the sports media did the best they could to turn that into a racial thing. Uh, but that, that ain't the interest of the Cooney Holmes fight that got everybody. The interest was we were seeing a slugger again. We were seeing somebody that knocked Ken Norton out in 54 seconds of the first round. Now, it was an older Ken Norton, yeah, uh, but it was still Ken Norton, and this, ki this kid was knocking everybody out. But Holmes gave him uh, Big John Tate syndrome. He gave Jerry Cooney the Tate syndrome. Uh, and, and Cooney was never the same. And... Uh, and Holmes was a great fighter. Holmes would have beat him on any day, I believe. Uh, now, I'm going to say something very controversial here. They hear me good. You guys know, me and my son, we we love and we pride on slugging. You, you know who we are. You know the cloth here. Uh, but I'm going to tell you all something. Yeah. Maybe 0% of the people that ever watch this video will believe me, but I know Larry Holmes in his prime would have schooled the hell out of Mike Tyson. Would have just completely annihilated him. With both of them in their primes. I know that. Now I'm going to tell you the other thing that you that you ain't going to believe me on. But I'm going to give it to you. Both in their primes, Mike Tyson would have annihilated Muhammad Ali. So you can digest that or cut the video off at this point. Or maybe you'll be the one person out of 20,000 that think that see what I see there. So anyway, I'm going to move on up rapidly the Klitschko's who get no credit. Uh, Vitaly, not so much because he held the WBC belt then retired and gave it up and went to Marin or whatever the hell political crap he does in the Ukraine. Then he came out of retirement and uh, just literally beat the crap out of Shannon Briggs for 12 rounds uh, causing him a whole lot of physical mess ups fractured eye socket and teeth and, but maybe he broke one or two of his ribs too and he messed Briggs up bad see he's pretty good for coming out of retirement but the one I want to talk about is Vladimir Klitschko this guy was just shy 
of holding all the other belts for 12 years. Just shy of 12 years. And uh, Tyson Fury did not fight no uh, young Klitschko. Had Tyson Fury fought a young Klitschko, Tyson Fury would have got, got whooped. He, he, Klitschko just would have would have won. Uh, I don't know if it would have been by a knockout, but he would have won. And he would have won on points or, or by a knockout. Uh, you know, I know when you watch things and you just, you, you can't see, but when, when you watch what I've watched over the years, you can kind of compare the two. But where you young guys are sitting, you don't really have a comparison. So, uh, maybe go back and look at some of these fights if you think I'm that crazy. And young boxers, if you go back and look at these fights, it's only going to help teach you. See? So, it'll be good for you. So, if you don't agree with me, go look and check it out. And then come back and tell me. Say, hey, well, I, I watched a couple of this guy's fights, and I don't really think it's that. I don't think you're right. And then tell me why you don't. Right? I'd love that. I'd love that. Only thing I don't like is, uh, oh hell, you're crazy for thinking that way. You stupid. And uh, boxing is a subjective sport, as much as we don't like it to be. Uh, so we have to keep that in mind. But the Klitschko's real great. We got to wait on Fury and got it. Uh, Wilder, no. I'm going to categorically, while we're talking about days of guys of today, it, and I've skipped some guys, I mean, I've skipped some guys. I, I'm pulling out favorites, not the greatest. So I haven't talked about Holyfield. Uh, Riddick Bow wasn't a longtime champion, but he was a great champion. Uh, the wars that uh, Bo Holyfield... I like Riddick Bo because Riddick Bo likes Joe. And he said a lot of nice things. And uh, 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 Bobby, uh, Riddick Bo and Joe go back and forth on, on uh, Facebook. And I love that. I love that. Riddick Bo is a nice man. And we love some Riddick Bow up in this house, too. Now, I know it's going to piss my friend off, Bob in, Bob in England, because uh, he's, he's going to first thing you say, Bob, I'm ready for it down here. <laughs> if you make it all the way through this 30 minutes now, I'm waiting on it down there. I won't say nothing else. We'll hear it, we'll hear it on Lennox Lewis. Lennox Lewis was great. What sets Lennox Lewis apart, in a way, is he was such a great amateur and such a great pro, and the longevity of it all. Uh, so he's a great, great heavyweight. Uh, so I know I've skipped some guys. Now, Deontay Wilder. All right. And Tyson Fury. Um I can't rate Tyson Fury as being great for beating up on Deontay Wilder. And here's why. Uh, Deontay Wilder has never been a good champion. Oh, he's been a good champion. Don't don't misunderstand me. Never been a great champion or a great boxer. He's got one punch. It's a right hand. Uh, clocks you right with it. Chances are you're going to hit the canvas. Uh, chances are Ali wouldn't hit the canvas. Lennox Lewis wouldn't hit the canvas. Holyfield wouldn't hit the canvas. Riddick Bow wouldn't hit the canvas. Tyson Fury didn't hit the canvas. Uh, I don't think Sonny Liston would have hit the canvas. Mike Tyson wouldn't hit the canvas. And I could just go on and on. Uh, my thing with Wilder, and I'm not judging him yet. I'm just saying he can't be, he's not not great or in my favorites yet. Um, he may not ever be because I don't like complainers. I don't like victims. People that walk in the world and they're a constant victim and Deontay Wilder 
uh, until he wins or when he loses, he's a constant victim. Nothing's ever his fault, I see. And that's not the mark of a champion. That's the mark of a fool. So I doubt he Well, he could be on. My, maybe he continues on. He's got some years left, and maybe I consider him the greatest guy of all time. We don't know what's going to happen in the future, but right now, no, and right now, no for Tyson Fury because uh, other than beating up an old Klitschko, what's Tyson Fury really done? Uh, what did Deontay Wilder ever do other than... Uh, last through one of the fights and make it to the end uh, to go to scorecards with one fight out of three he had with uh, Tyson Fury. So, as much as I don't think Tyson Fury, uh, he, that he has to go to prove something, Wilder's way down here because he couldn't even uh, make it through two out of the three fights. Uh, First one you can question some, that second one you can't question none, he got knocked out, got his ass handed to him. And if the second one were allowed to continue, that's exactly what was going to happen in the second one. And if they have a fourth one, that's exactly what's going to happen in the fourth one. And he, Fury's in Wilder's head now, so they ain't going to up there. <laughs> they ever fight again, Fury can go get whoever. I don't think Malik Scott's the answer. Uh, one of my good Facebook friends is very educated in the art of boxing, thinks Malik Scott has helped Deontay Wilder out tremendously. He sees a big, good, positive change. Another one of my boxing friends whom I, I get a lot of my news and commentary from. Uh, he looked at the fight Wilder just had and he like me, he sees something wrong with Wilder. Even though he knocked the guy out real quick he's seen something and I saw it too and I brought it to the forefront of my brain after he said something about it. And after he said something about it, I clearly saw what he saw which is something's not right going on with him right now. And Boxing is fickle. You can tote an ass whooping. You can get your pride hurt. You, uh, you can get your face bashed. And it's hard to just come back from that, folks. There's a lot of, a whole lot of psychology in combat sports and nothing easy. But I just mentioned some of my favorite fighters. Uh, you know I ramble, so that's why I got into Tyson Fury and Wilder. But, uh, now we're going back. Charles Sonny Liston. Uh, Charles Sonny Liston had over 60, 60 to 65 fights. I'm going off memory here. Uh, lost one fight mid drift in his career. Immediately challenged the guy he lost to and knocked that guy out. Uh, so, and then lost twice to Ali. Something was fickle in both those fights. Uh, there's a lot of not right going on. I don't care who tries to tell me what, especially the second fight. Um, and then lost to Leo Martin on his next to last fight. His last fight was with Chuck Wettler, the guy who Ali fought him uh, six or seven years later, fought Chuck Wetner, and that inspired Sylvester Stallone to write, produce, and star in the movie called Rocky. That was the inspiration for the movie Rocky, see. Uh, Chuck Wetner was considered one of the toughest men the industry ever produced. And you go watch Chuck Wepner, who fought Ali, he fought everybody, he fought all the great ones. And you go listen to who he said hit him the hardest and who wreaked havoc on him. 
and destruction and intimidation. And Wetner says, you know, I was I was the intimidator. I was the enforcer arm of boxing. And then I came up on Sonny Liston. And every time that guy hit me, he broke something or ripped skin off my face or my body. And he had to get 93 stitches in his face. He had broke ribs, broke cheekbone, I believe maybe a broke jaw, a broke orbital, and I mean, there's four or five other things. I guess a broke nose. Uh, and that was the last fight Sonny Liston had. And Sonny Liston may have been, uh, it's possible he could have been 50 years old at that very time. Then we really don't. There's a lot of speculation as to the age of Sonny Liston. And, uh, Sonny Liston is a mystery. And he is my favorite fighter. And he's Joe's first or second uh, favorite. Joe, Joe's real, first or second or third because Joe's really, uh, Joe Lewis, uh, Sonny Liston and Mike Tyson. And depending on what hour of the day you catch Joe as to who his favorite is. Uh, he holds those three guys, those three men, in very high regard. And he respects them. And uh, he's a big Jack Dempsey fan, too. He's went back and looked at these Jack Dempsey fights. And he's like, Dad, that dude does what I do. And I'm like... And he says, you never taught me to do this. I, I said, son, you're just doing it. You, you do it on your own. And uh, so anyway, that's my ramble for today. Hopefully four or five people will watch this through all the way to the end. And uh, we'll get closer to the views we need. <laughs> so Joe can make a few dollars. Get him a new pair of boxing gloves or a new big bag. That's what he's really wanting. He's wanting one of those big king size, huge bags because he keep you know the bags. He just knocks them all over the place. So maybe we can get him a big bag out of it. If he can start making a few bucks here and there on YouTube. But much love to all of you. God bless your hearts for watching us and watching Joe. And it's just a pleasure. For me that anybody that comes along that listen to an old man and uh, watch an old old daddy's young son and we certainly appreciate it and much love to you and I, I, I wish God's blessings on you and remember pray for what you what God needs you to have over what you think you want. Uh, that's a winning combination there. Bye, folks.